The Global Energy Leaders Podcast, Episode 70. Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. Welcome to another edition of the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Ray. So good to have you. And we have on Tom Kirkman today, who is a monthly contributor now to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. And we are really thankful for Tom. Be sure to check out Tom on Olpro, where he's very, very active, as we talk about on the show today. And we will link to that in the show notes so you can find it. Without further ado, here is Tom Kirkman. Well, Tom, it's been a few months since the last time we spoke. It's good to have you back on the program. Nice to be back here. Thanks. Yeah. Well, a lot's happened. I think it was, we were talking offline May 30th or so since the last time we spoke. And today is July 20th because these come out a little bit later than when when we record them. And a lot's happened. I mean, you've got the OPEC news, you've got Qatar, Mm -hmm. you've got Venezuela. All these things are circling around. Uh, Give us kind of your thought, just general 30,000 foot global oil picture. What are you seeing some trends for people to watch for? You're right. There's been a whole lot happening, and I've been paying close attention to Qatar, the the, the Venezuela mess, shale, the the the, the oil, the, the amount of recoverable reserves is grossly overstated. <laughs> so let let's start with OPEC. OPEC is falling apart. Agreement to reduce uh, output uh, already is falling apart. So that's going to unravel. I know Saudi Arabia has been trying like crazy to push up the price of oil in order to boost their upcoming IPO for Aramco, and I just don't see it happening. Uh, they're, they're going to be running like crazy on a hamster wheel and just <laughs> not going to get anywhere. I, I don't see the, the price of oil going above and staying above 50 And actually, this might annoy some people, I don't think it should. $50 for a barrel sounds about right. Anything much higher, you're going to get the huge roller coaster in in oil prices because everyone will start producing and then it'll get the huge glut again and prices crash down, you know, $20, $30 a barrel, something like that. Anything much lower than 50 is going to cause long-term damage to all oil producing, you know, countries and exporters. So $50, and I've been saying this for a couple of years, this is nothing new. Uh, So if it stays somewhere around 50, People are going to have to live with it. The Gulf states want it much higher. You know, some of the countries need $100 oil. Not going to happen. Just <laughs> not. Uh, if the price of oil goes up, you, you see what happens with U.S. shale. It just the, the drilling and the ducks, the drilled but uncompleted wells, all that right. come back on the line very, very quickly and just right. totally crash the price of oil. So if it stays around $50 a barrel, I'll be happy. I said that two years ago. I said that a year ago. I said it a month ago. I'll say it again. If oil stays around $50 a barrel, I'll be happy. Going on to Venezuela, <laughs> uh, it's uh, actually I don't I've been know paying if more we've got attention. enough time for all yeah. of that. <laughs> I'm sorry? I don't know if we've got time, enough time to break down everything that's going on in Venezuela, but but go ahead and try. Uh, oh, no. It, it just, just like Qatar. Qatar's a mess also. But it, Venezuela is one huge, <laughs> complete mess. Right. First, you've got a, a socialist country that's basically driven the entire economy into the ground by seizing private assets and the government taking it over and the government actively kicking out experienced people out of, out of the oil. Let's, let's concentrate on oil here. Kicking experienced engineers and managers out of the oil company, replacing them with, you know, government compliant nincompoops who don't know how how to run a company or how to produce oil. And they, they've basically run their oil industry into the ground. This morning I read, uh, it, it's 5 a.m. here. So uh, I was reading the news a little bit before before I got on the, on the show here. And uh, Venezuela is actively trying to get OPEC to uh, reduce output even more because they desperately need $100 oil to uh, you know keep their country from completely going bankrupt. Basically, in about five months, they have a number of huge long-term debts due, and I don't see they're going to pay them. So I, I can see the entire country of Venezuela defaulting, basically, around the end of this year, the beginning of next year, because $100 oil just is not going to happen. So Maduro has no one to blame but himself and Chavez. Uh, as I said, when you take experienced, competent people out of the oil industry and re- replace them with government drones who don't know anything right uh you, you're just you're just shooting yourself in the foot so it's going to be amusing in the next week or so with venezuela trying to persuade along with saudi arabia 
uh, other countries in OPEC to reduce production in, in order to bump up prices. And all that's going to happen is if, if the prices do go above $50 a barrel, not only will U.S. fracking increase, but you've got a huge army <laughs> of drilled but uncompleted wells that can very, very quickly be brought online and just absolutely saturate the market again. And th then the oil price will plunge back down. And I'm not joking when I say 20 or $30 a barrel. Uh, it's quite possible. If, if, if the price of oil spikes and it goes up to $60 a barrel because of some political, you know, let's say Qatar, you know, it really gets into a mess. Saudi Arabia inv invades another country or something. Right. Uh, if the price of oil does go up to $60 a barrel, what I see very quickly happening is, and I'm talking weeks, uh, not months, is U.S. shale goes through the roof, ducks turned on, the drilled but uncompleted wells turned on, massive overproduction, and then a huge drop in oil prices down into the 20s and 30s. More likely the 30s, but it's quite possible the 20s. And this is just everyone shooting themselves in the foot. So... The U.S. is not going to cooperate with OPEC because it's a cartel. And in the U.S., you're not allowed to be in a cartel. Uh, it's mostly free market in the U.S. And what's happening with the U.S. shale is these guys have to pump as much as they can in order to pay the bills every month to keep the lights on because they, they've got to service their debts. You go into debt to to drill these wells and you've got to produce as much as possible with, with, with uh, you know, the severe drop off rate. I mean, you're talking... 75% within a couple of years drop off rate. It's it's steep. So get the money while you can, regardless of what the oil price is, just to keep the lights on so you don't go bankrupt. So if oil stays around $50 a barrel, which I'd be quite happy with, the world is going to have to learn to live with it. The oil producing uh, countries and the oil producing, you know, oil producers in general are just going to have to learn to live with it. If it goes too high, a disaster will happen. If it goes too low long term, the same thing is going to happen. Price will eventually skyrocket because uh, long term assets are not being actively looked for and you'll get the roller coaster again. $50 is avoiding the roller coaster, in my opinion. Right. So I've been talking like crazy. What, what, what do you think? Well, I, I think I, mean, I agree with you. And, and I think we're I think we're saying the same thing here um, is. I haven't thrown out a number because to me the number doesn't matter. It's wherever the market can be stable at, and so fifty dollars is it seems to be kind of the the magic number right now. Um, and I think that's what you're saying too. If it was seventy or, or or whatever, it doesn't really matter where the number is. It's just that if it go right now, if it goes up to seventy, that would cause the increase in drilling and the ducks coming online. And so the number for me is is where can the market be stable at? And I think fifty, like you're saying, it seems to be the good number there. Um, the thing I read the other day was I think it was John Kemp from Reuters put out a report saying that. You know, despite the rig count rising in the U.S., the day rates haven't matched that increase. And so you're seeing that the vendors are learning to live with this price, but um, the lower prices that they've had to, you know, be competitive in the market. And it's like, okay, you know what? The vendors, we've taken it on the chin here. You know, the oil companies, let's just slow down. Let's pump our brakes. We want stability in the market. We have employees that we're trying to put food in their mouths. We have insurance and we have all this stuff that we're trying to do here. Uh, stability in the market is what I want. I'm with you. If 50 is the number to keep it stable at, then that's what we really want to see. Yeah, fifty dollars is what I and that's just my opinion. But I started I started this out about two years ago, right about uh, when oil crash really started crashing. I'm just going. I'm looking at this, and I was looking at the historical data, and I'm going, you know, somewhere between forty and sixty, you know, the the upper and lower range. And, and uh, a lot of people were thinking, oh, oil will never go down to forty. Well, right. yeah, yes, right. it can. <laughs> yeah, missed that. One. Uh, so I'm just looking at it, and uh, the more I look at this, the the psychological number seems to be around 50. Anything above 50 seems to cause massive roller coastering and mm -hmm, anything mm -hmm. below 50 causes extreme pain and people go crazy and you can't invest and you know everyone gets laid off. Uh, so 50 is doable in my opinion. Yeah. And so I, I think though the, the one thing that you brought up and that gets left out a lot is the ducks, you know, and, and, and you know, we look at the rig count so often and we look at the rig count, we look at the price, and then, and, 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 and then you go, oh my gosh, what about the ducks? You know, it's the highest in history. Right. It's the highest. It's over 5,000. It just remembered a couple of years ago, the ducks were estimated. There's, It's impossible to right. come it's, up it's with, an unknown with number. an exact count. Yeah. A, but roughly, uh, a couple of years ago, it was estimated two to 3,000. Now it's over 5,000. Over 5,000 for certain. So the number of drilled but uncompleted wells keeps increasing. And it's, you know, you realize at some point they're going to have to open these up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So it, it, 
when, when they open it up and they're just waiting for the price to go up. And I'm thinking what's going to happen is if the price spikes up much more above 50, we will get a sudden deluge. So uh, well, Saudi Arabia that... tried to prop, prop up their prices for their IPO. It's, right. it's not, it's not going to work long term. You can't artificially inflate or decrease prices on a long term basis. So since we're talking about Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, let's go to Qatar. <laughs> Saudi Arabia, as far as I'm concerned, shot themselves in the foot by uh, coming up with uh, the really ridiculous reasons uh, to try and impose sanctions on Qatar. And then Saudi Arabia blinked and backed off. And now they really don't know what to, what to do. Qatar is now uh, doing, you know, getting closer and closer to Iran, which is just causing all sorts of trouble with Saudi Arabia. Bin Salman, the, the, the new hothead in charge, I'm totally unimpressed with. He's scary. He's dangerous. Uh, he's he's very un- instability in the Middle East. That's not what we need right now. So I don't know what his reaction is going to be, but Qatar is basically digging in and saying, screw you. So their LNG, they, they, they said they're going to increase about 30% uh, by the end of 2020. They want to stay the number one LNG exporter in the world. Australia was overset to take them. So was the US, but Qatar is basically saying, nope, we're going to stay on top. And... Actually, I don't blame them. Very, very low cost LNG, huge amounts of reserves. And I'm not talking about the politics. Uh, the, the reasons for the, the blockade and all that stuff is complete and utter nonsense, in my opinion. I've, I've said that very, very clearly in, in comments. Uh, but the, the people who are making the accusations are just as guilty as, you know, it's the pot calling the kettle black. Right. So uh, the, the end result is now Saudi Arabia has got all sorts of fighting going on. This endless, it's not going to end anytime soon, battle going on in Yemen. Uh, There's just proxy wars between Saudi Arabia and and Iran. Now what they've done is forced Qatar to get closer to Iran. Uh, Russia is playing both sides. They're they're talking oil and gas deals with both Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia has offered basically LNG in the Arctic to Saudi Arabia, and they want to do some both oil and gas deals with Iran. So what's bizarre to me is Russia is now being the diplomat right. <laughs> in the oil and gas world. The U.S. is not. The U.S. is a wild card. Uh, don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking for a minute and let you. <laughs> well, yeah, I want to talk about the Qatar and the LNG. I, I saw that report, uh, I don't know, a week or two ago, whenever it came out. And I was kind of fascinated by it because... You know, it's one of those things where if you're a U.S. company and you're trying to produce LNG, um, from, there's, a, there's a standpoint in which you have a better marketing strategy. You can go to a country and say, you could buy it from us, and you don't have to worry about the instability that you might get with buying it from a country like Qatar. Uh, but if mm-hmm. the price is that much cheaper, it's a hard sell. And so it's like, you know, I, I don't know how, how the, you know, the geopolitics here will play a role into how, this, how these contracts, because you, you know these contracts can be very long. Um, but I'm curious, what do you think about that? Will, will just the stability of the U.S. versus the Qatar be a selling point, even though countries might have to pay uh, over the course of the contract at least a lot more for it? Possibly. Uh, the, the long-term contracts are being reduced and more and more. I mean, the, the, the big US, the selling point of the U.S. Uh, LNG is even though the price is higher, they allow reselling. And there's no long-term real contracts like, the, like Qatar is trying to do. So Qatar is going to have to renegotiate some of the long-term LNG contracts. They're already starting to do this with India. India is demanding that Qatar invest in some of India's national you know, oil and gas infrastructure as a condition of buying LNG from Qatar. And more and more LNG, because of the glut, and uh, uh, let me back up a little bit, the impending glut in Global LNG is going to get worse and worse. I don't know if I've touched on this last time we talked or not, but it's going to get worse and worse until probably 2020. So the price of LNG is going to continue to go down just because of the overproduction in the marketplace. Right. Qatar is going to increase, but they're they're not going to really hit the increases until after 2020, which is about the time that I see the pendulum swinging back and global LNG goes from oversupply to undersupply. So they're, they're timing it about right. The U.S., yes, they have more stability, but there's transportation costs. Uh, but it, it, you're right, it's a toss-up. It's a toss-up between stability and and uh, lower prices. So Qatar really has the, some of the lowest prices in the world for creating and exporting LNG. I don't really have an answer there. 
Yeah, well, you know, the thing I think that as you talk about this stuff globally, there's so many layers to to this discussion, you know, and what's going on. And, you know, we're talking offline about, you know, the, this some of the, the talk about the U.S. economy and where it could head in the next six to eight months. And mm-hmm. and, and all of those, and, and how the global economy does, right? Well, you, you just said, well, the glut's expected to 2020. Well, that's based upon the, the, the economy's growing at a certain projection over the next, you know, three years. And if they don't yep. hit those marks, well, then it could be 2022, 2024, or, or whatever the case may be. So I love talking about this stuff because you, you sit back and you look at it and you go, okay, well, this this is where this could go and this is where this could go. But, you know, we see Venezuela. Okay, well, that's just one country. Well, what if other countries start to default and fall apart? All of this stuff changes and it's very fluid. And it, it, it's one of those things where it, it, it seems like it, there's a long buildup to where we're, where we're going to be at. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, oil's at $20 a barrel. What happened? You know, and so, you know, kind of catch <laughs> you. you you're on the roller coaster and you just don't know when the cliff you're going to go over it, if that makes sense. But see, the roller coaster never ends. And that's what I find so fascinating about global oil and gas. I'm, I'm fascinated by global oil and gas and global oil and gas politics because there's so much that, politics that drives, you know, oil and, and gas prices up and down. Uh, decisions being made on whether to produce more or produce less. So, uh, What's going on in the Middle East between uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the you know the the Gulf countries? There, is, that's politics driven. It's not oil and gas driven, but it's going to affect oil and gas prices. So uh, yes, it is a fascinating game, and no, the roller coaster is never going to end. <laughs> but if we can, if it can stay somewhere around fifty, you know, you won't have all these <laughs> stomach dropping right uh, cliffs that you're suddenly whoa crap what's going on? Uh, so I think everyone is just sort of like hoping for a little bit of stability and the best stability that I can estimate is if, if we can just stay in the range of around $50 a barrel. I think, I think everyone could learn to live with that for a while. Now you mentioned earlier on the show, and I want to circle back around to this. You, you, we, uh, mm-hmm. you mentioned the report about that the, uh, the U S shale reserves aren't as good as maybe some U S producers and politicians oh, yes. have talked about. Give us your thoughts on that. Yep. Uh, just because you have oil reserves does not mean they're either, recoverable or economically recoverable. So shale that uh, shale in particular, because uh, even though the oil is in the ground, the extraction rate is very, very low, much, much lower than uh, conventional oil wells. So some people think an oil well is like a giant lake underground. No, it's not. <laughs> it's all of the stuff is inside stone. So conventional oil, uh, you can extract. I, I, it, it varies, but shale oil is below 20% is recoverable. Some some cases it's only 5% recoverable and then there's a huge drop off rate. So just because someone says that there's huge amounts of oil in the US inside shale, yes, that's technically true, but it doesn't mean you can actually recover all of it. Uh, so I would say whoever put together the estimates of how much recoverable reserves there are in the US are an economist and not an actual geologist. I'm not a geologist, but uh, on Oil Pro, we've got geologists that, that speak up. And it's just basically overstated by the government because uh, and I'm not pointing at the, the, the finger at the current administration or the previous administration, just the government. They're basically saying, no, there's, there's, the government is saying there's a lot more recoverable reserves than there actually is. And that's going to be a problem. So let me, let me play devil's advocate yep. here. Um, okay. So, Go ahead. um, what if tomorrow? I think what you're saying is is that okay, the oil is actually in the ground, but we just can't recover it either a because the technology uh, isn't there, or b it would be so expensive, especially if it did our oil, you couldn't do it. So the the oil's there, but you know we could theoretically have technology that would come out in the next six months, year, two years, whatever that would then allow us to recover the oil. Is, is that not true? Yes, and if somebody can do that, they would be a multi billionaire. Right. So <laughs> so what you, so so the so the premise really is that if I'm hearing you correctly, is that the U.S. the U.S. side of things should probably be a little bit more clear is that there's X amount of oil in the ground, and currently we can we can recover this this percentage of it. Would that be a better way to put it? That would be a better way to put it. Uh, and also, you have to look at how much it's going to cost to do it. Yeah, right. you have to understand for conventional wells, you can you you can drill a little bit, and then uh, you can you can extract it from underground the the through the rocks. Uh, it's fairly permeable uh, in fracking in shale. You've got to you know drill every couple hundred meters. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So it, it's a lot of costs in into a small area. So 
you have to take into account how much it's going to cost to continuously keep drilling and keep fracturing all that shale layered underground, whereas in a conventional oil well, you don't have to do that. So yes, the cost is going to be prohibitive in actually recovering a lot of these oil reserves that, that are basically locked inside the fairly impermeable shale. Right. I did see the other day, this is maybe two weeks ago, and I'll be telling the report or not, that they're getting ready, they're looking at refracking the Barnett shale. Um, did you happen to come across mm-hmm. that report? Nope. Okay. Uh, I well, the no, the- I, I haven't. Yeah, I, I don't. I didn't get to study it in depth, but I think the theory was is that you know back when they did it back then, now they know a lot more about fracking, and they want to go back and maybe give it a second look. What I found interesting is, it's like, oh, man, boy, I don't know if we want a bunch more natural gra- gas on the market right now, so I wasn't really sure that was a good thing for the market, but uh, I found it interesting that there is some talk, at least, about going back in and re-exploring the Barnett, which is basically, you know, gets no talk anymore. But that, that makes no sense to me. Why would you do that? Well, there's already an oversupply, and as we've mentioned before, there's already 5,000 ducks. <laughs> why, why are you going to go back and refrack? Well, again, I, actually, I, again, I guess it's just to keep paying the bills and uh, keep right. the lights turned on. Uh, you, you've got you've got to pay for all these debts somehow, so I guess I guess that's the reason why. But all it's going to do is just continue to add to the oversupply. Yeah, I need to go back and read the report. My, my thoughts were kind of some of the stuff that you're saying is that if you have leases, you know, that are going to expire, and I don't know if that may be the case or not, well, then you need to do something. Um, and so maybe the whales are falling off. I, I don't know. I, I was curious if you saw it or not. I saw. I kind of saw some headlines, and we had a, a company here in town saying, yeah, we're hearing that it's going to pick back up. And we're like, oh, man, okay, well, that, that may be a good for the short term, but it just doesn't seem that the long-term cycle is going to work there. And as you mentioned, you know, these companies, uh, most of them, they're so heavy leveraged on, you know, on um, on bank loans debt. and, and yeah, debt yeah. and, and, and um, credit lines is the word I was looking for there. And, you know, they've, they've got to keep paying it. And in, in, in the end, if they're publicly traded, which most of them are, that makes it worse because then you've got the stockholders who are really pressuring you to make a certain, you know, make a certain amount of money. And so it's quarterly. Yes, yeah. Yes. And so it makes it makes it very tough. And I, I think that, you know, um, I was at a conference earlier this week and I, we were talking about educators and business people and licensing groups and just how their interests aren't aligned. And I think that that same analogy kind of works here, at least in the oil and gas industry, is that you have folks like me and you who work in the industry and we have our interests and you have certain oil producers and midstream companies and they have their interests and you have folks like the OPEC. And it doesn't seem like on on, on most days <laughs> when you get down to it that all of our interests are aligned. You know, you've got everyone We're who not. has their own <laughs> goal. And uh, for most of us, though, we just want a job that gives us a paycheck. You know it. Yes, it's true. Uh, there's there's no alignment, and yes, everyone does want to keep a, a paycheck, whether whether it's a government or an individual. Uh, but no, they, they're not playing very well together. Uh, the U.S. U.S. shale is reminds me of being so far in debt that you get a credit card to pay off uh, another credit card, and that's just a short road to disaster. So at some point, there's going to be more and more bankruptcies in independent U.S. fracking, just because the, the debt is going to catch up. Uh, a, a much smaller scale than what what is going on in Venezuela, but I mean, right. it's 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 not it's not sustainable the way it is unless the price of oil goes up. But I don't see any sustainable way for the price of oil to go up with an oversupply of of oil in the market. Uh, so, I mean, if, if oil went up to seventy and stayed at seventy magically, just watch how much additional fracking would go on in the U.S. and how much oversupply would hit the market. And that's only the U.S. Uh, Venezuela would try and, you know, ramp up Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, everyone would just right. ramp up oil production so bad it would totally crash the price all over again. Right, right. So debt is the, debt is the biggest problem, with, and it's not normally talked about in U.S. media that I can see, the debt of U.S. fracking. Well, uh, yeah, and, you know, I think for the listeners who might be interested in looking up this, go back to when Chesapeake was in their heyday in the Haynesville Shale and, and and if you go back and kind of read some of the stories about when when the things started falling apart for them, go and just read about the credit lines they had, and you know they got new credit lines, and you know I think they got one, it's like three hundred and something million dollar credit line, and they still had to reduce their operating budget by you know so much percentage. And we were working for them at the time, going, holy, holy cow, you're wait, this is all leveraged, you know? There's, there's no mm-hmm. there's no cash here, you know? And mm-hmm. you know because they were spending money like crazy, and, and they're talking about how much these wells were making and stuff, and you're like. Wait a second. Where is all this money going? You know, and so, but the, but you could go back. That's a big company that you could go back and see. Now, obviously, Aubrey was a uh, controversial figure, so you could say, well, he was maybe an outlier. And I would say, okay, he's probably an outlier on how he did some things. But as far as just kind of some basic concepts on how how they're borrowing money and these credit lines and stuff like that work, 
that's there's a lot of companies that are doing it like that. Yes, and if they stop getting bank loans and getting new bank loans to service their existing bank loans, then like I said, they're going to go belly up, and that's just the simple facts. Uh, if you get too far in debt, whether you're an individual or a government or a state, <laughs> Illinois comes to mind. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> If, if you get so far in debt that you can't get out, you're not going to be able to continue operating as usual. And that's what I'm saying. I can foresee a number of bankruptcies coming up in U.S. fracking simply because they're over leveraged by debt. And everyone's everyone seems to be hoping that the oil is going to recover. Well, you know what? To me, $50 is recovered. <laughs> right. No, no, no. You go yeah. much higher than that, then you get onto the huge roller coaster again. So yeah. this, this, this comes back to the magic number. To me, $50 is recovered. Right. It, it, I think it creeped up to 51 this morning. Uh, mm-hmm. So if it goes up a little higher, watch, it'll just drop off again. It'll get down to the, you know, high to mid 40s. So if, if it stays around 50, that's the number that seems to gravitate toward. Then uh, if U.S. fracking can actually subsist on $50, th- there, there will be some bankruptcies, but some will continue going on. But something's going to happen with all these ducks because of the leases. That, yeah, you can't just right. drill them and leave them forever in the ground. It doesn't work that way. Right. Well, and, you know, just, just to your point earlier, we are talking about the magic number. And like I say, I am i don't really have an opinion on what the magic number should be. I, I would think that kind of what you're saying is right. We, but we want stability. And I think, you know, there's so many people that are hurting, at least stateside, you know, looking for jobs that they're kind of hoping for those booms. And it's like, you know, we, I understand your pain, but that would probably be the worst thing for you. You'd get geared back up and you'd go to work and spend a bunch of money to move yeah, out boom. to wherever. And then, you know, you're back to where you are. So... It's not that we're saying yeah. this because we're, we're cold-hearted. It's because you know, we, we actually want you know long-term job security. Um, you know, but look, I'm to, I know you got to go. You got to get ready to go to work. You're on the other side of the world from us over in Malaysia, and so yeah. we appreciate your time. And I want to say publicly, um, the listeners don't know this obviously, but you, uh, we had a technical difficulty last week. We were supposed to record this, and it was all my fault. So thank you so much for being gracious to come back on, and you are going to be a monthly contributor for us. So we appreciate that. Um, tell folks in the meantime before you come on again where they can come and find you and dialogue with you at on the internet. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'm still a moderator on Oil Pro. That's www.oilpro.com. Uh, I'm pretty active there. I'm normally on there every day unless I'm really, really tied up at work. Uh, and it's I, I think it's still the number two oil and gas website on the internet. Rigzone is still the monster uh, because they, they discuss a lot of things about jobs and stuff like that. But uh, I like Oil Pro because the comments, very active comment section. Well, I get the so, I get the daily yes. newsletter, and it, like every, almost every day, your your pictures on there is one of the top contributors. So yeah, <laughs> it's safe to say you are very active. Uh, I actually yes, I'm I'm definitely one of the top contributors, and if if I'm not on there, it usually means I'm busy at work. And th- this week, actually, I've been fairly quiet because we've got uh, ISO auditing going on. Uh, and other than that, but normally, yes, normally I'll, I'll spend a couple hours a day uh, uh, looking over, reading through the comments, putting my own two cents in, and I'm very easy to contact on there. Well, Tom, thank you so much so, for coming on, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, on a monthly basis, and thank you for that as well. Yes, thank you. I look forward to it. <clears throat> Tom, thanks again for coming on. Really enjoyed just going back and forth with you. I'm quite knowledgeable about the oil and gas industry, and so it's enjoyable to talk to people um, and just kind of free flow. You know, what do you think? Because as we talked about in the show today, there are so many things that, that affect the oil and gas industry. So thanks again to Tom for coming on. We really enjoyed it. The Global Energy Leaders Podcast is produced by Michael Sims and Chris Prine. Chris Prine also serves as editor for the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. Until next time, keep climbing. Thanks for listening to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R-Squared Global. 